Hey y'all, welcome back to another midweek Unplugged series. Uh, we are in the book of Habakkuk and we want to thank you for joining us this week as we dive into this minor prophet book in the Old Testament. Let's pray real quick and then we'll get into it. Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, and I am so glad that we have this opportunity to join you in your word and really to just listen to what you have to say to us tonight. Father, I pray that as we read in the book of Habakkuk um, about the prophet and about what you said to him, Father, during his time of turmoil, Father, that you would allow our perception of you to be made more clear and more radiant, Father. God, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, church, tonight, again, as I mentioned, we are going to be in the book of Habakkuk. If you haven't watched already, go ahead and go back real quick to the video from last week where we talked about the introduction of Habakkuk and really who Habakkuk was um, as a prophet of the Lord, his zeal for the word of God, and really what was happening in Judah during this time. So today, as we get into it, we're going to read the, the first chapter of Habakkuk. And so let's read it real quick, and then we'll kind of break down what's happening here. I'm reading out of the New King James Version, so whatever version you have, I'm sure it'll match up, hopefully fine. Um, here's what it says here. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded for I will do a work, or excuse me, for I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe though you were told. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to, possessing, to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from them. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their charges charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to, to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. And then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing this power to his God. Verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil. You cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person excuse me, more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? Verse 15, they take up all of, all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad there. Therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet. Because of them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? Now this is just the first chapter of Habakkuk. It seems like an odd sort of wording that Habakkuk is using when he, he's going through and he's talking about really how Judah is, is sinful. Judah is, is, is corrupted by Jehoiakim, which we talked about last week, uh, by this evil king who just doesn't care for God's word, has no, no regrets, no remorse for it. And he says, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? Why have you left us just un unhanded, empty-handed. Why have you just left us here for us to just die? Why are you not judging? Why are we just sitting in sin? Again, Habakkuk is zealous for God's law. He wants the children of Judah to be able to follow God's law, to do right in the sight of God. And yet he's sitting there in despair, mourning Judah. He's like, what are you doing, God? Why are you just absent and silent? 
And God responds to him in verse 5 where it says, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. See, we see this kind of juxtaposition where the perception that Habakkuk has on God changes throughout this chapter. And I want to look at that here real quick because this week we're going to be talking about perception. Again, as we're diving into this Habakkuk, in the verse, very first verse, this, this prophet is burdened by his perception. There's something that's weighing him down by the perception that he has of his nation, of the people around him, and by God, his perception of God. It says, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. He's perceiving these things, and this is what he sees in the very first few uh, verses there, verses two through four. He perceives the Lord as silent or absent. Now, Habakkuk, again, is, is a prophet, meaning that God speaks to him directly. Uh, during the Old Testament, there, there are people who God would just speak to directly. Their, their, the Holy Spirit wasn't as abounding as he was uh, or as he is now after the veil was torn in the Gospels. But we see Habakkuk as a prophet, someone who knows the law, uh, someone who knows the first five books of the Bible, which is called the Torah at that time. And, and we see that he is so zealous for God. He prays to God. He, he does the sacrifices to God that he needs to do. He is, he is a churchman of churchmen. He is the prophet of the Lord. God speaks to him. And yet he says, God, where are you? God, why are you silent? And this obviously has been going on for a, lot, for a while because he's kind of fed up. He's burdened with this. And he says, oh, Lord, verse 2, oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Habakkuk has obviously been here for a while. He's obviously been feeling this way for a while. We don't see the backstory of it. We don't see his growing up, his coming to be sort of thing. But we do see him in this moment. And I think it's important for us to see this, that we, have, we can sometimes be in a space for so long where we feel God is not listening. And yet we have to understand that God really is. See, he is faced, he, I'm speaking of Habakkuk, Habakkuk is faced with Judah's wickedness and, and their depravity. And he wonders, where is God? God, why are you not doing anything? God, things are going so bad right now. Things are just dark and dim and there seems to be no hope. And they, where are you, God? Church, I think a lot of times we can be there as Christians, as, as just people of God, just people who are, who are trying to follow God. Things are going, uh, you know, we're reading our word, we're going to church, we're, we're praying, we're, we're praising, we are listening to the worship music. You know, we, we have given up our vices and we're saying, God, I just want you, God, I just want you. And it seems like it's falling on deaf ears. It seems like sometimes when, we, when we're trying to have this conversation with God, it's like talking to a toddler sometimes because, and I'm not comparing God to a toddler, but it's like you're, you're telling them, hey, you should go do this, or hey, how was your day? And they just don't say anything. Maybe that's more like a teenager. I was a youth pastor. It's definitely a teenager. And sometimes we can just feel like we're talking to a brick wall. It's just like, God, where are you? God, I need this. God, I just want to bless you. And, and there's nothing's happening. It seems so dark and dim, and that's where Habakkuk is at. Habakkuk is in a spot where not only as a prophet, but somebody who loves his nation, the, the nation of Judah, who has these promises from God, that it just seems like God is absent. And so he perceives God as somebody who doesn't care. Verse 3 says this, Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. I love this. I love this verse because what, what Habakkuk is really saying is like, God, I know from your law, I know right from wrong, you've allowed me to really see that just as God gives us grace when, when we become saved and, and we begin to realize our depravity and how much we need him and, and this is sin and that's sin and, and God, I don't want to do that anymore. Habakkuk is sort of in that same atmosphere where he says, God, you've allowed me to see this. Why do you show me iniquity? Why do you show me trouble? And there's this underlying tone of, why do you show me these things if you're not going to do anything? And then God answers. So first and foremost, he perceives the Lord as silent. And then God answers, and, and God goes through this um, pretty crazy message that he gives, and it, it kind of speaks to uh, Habakkuk in a prophetic way. 
And I won't read through it again, but verses basically 5 through uh, 11, God is, is telling Habakkuk how, hey, if you want judgment, I'll bring judgment. I will make this right because you are right. Habakkuk, I am a just God. I am a God who has laws and they need to be followed and I am a just God. And he, he begins to say, I will bring judgment in the form of the Babylonians. The Chaldeans are coming. Now that's scary. The Chaldeans, the, the Babylonians, they were known for being absolutely ruthless. They would take and pillage villages, uh, burn them down, leave nothing left. They would take the men and they would enslave them to really just do work. And we'll see that later on. Um, not in this series, but you'll see that later on in the Bible with uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when the children of Israel actually are taken to Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. Great story. Make sure you read through that as well. But they are just absolutely barbaric. These people, they have no regard for the sanctity of human life, and, and they just do as they please. They're, they're really, they just go for it in a bad way. And God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring them to you. I'm going to, if you want judgment, I will bring judgment. And this isn't in a spiteful way that God is saying this, but he's just saying that I am who I say that I am. I am a God of justice. And so Habakkuk begins to see that God is a God of judgment. He begins to perceive that God's no longer silent and absent, but he's, he's a God of judgment. He's a God of justice. And he begins to respond with a moment of faith. So we go through this whole thing, look at the nations and watch, be utterly astounded. God is saying, I will release, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation against you. They come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. And we go through all this. And then in verse 12, Habakkuk begins to realize God is here. Okay, I'm hearing God now. This is great. And he begins to have a moment of faith. He's like, oh God, are you not the everlasting in verse 12? Uh, are you, O Lord, oh Lord, my God, my holy one? We shall not die. Now that's an interesting thing to say right after God says, hey, I'm going to bring judgment on your nation in the form of the Chaldeans, the, the Babylonians, who are absolutely ruthless, and they're just going to take over. And Habakkuk responds in this moment and says, cool, we're not going to die. How does that add up? How does he go from God's going to be ruthless or going to release this ruthless nation on us, and they're just going to take us and, and pillage our villages and all that stuff, and then we're not going to die. And the reason is because he says, you have appointed them for judgment. He begins to perceive God a little bit differently and know that there is a method to God's madness. I say that jokingly, but there, there's a method to what God is doing. But then his faith quickly turns to confusion. Because again, he, he has read the Torah, he has read the, the sayings that have come before. He knows what, who God is. He follows God. He speaks with God. And all of a sudden, he begins to see God through this lens of confusion and, and almost as if God is contradictory. He begins to perceive God as contradictory. He goes from saying, Oh, Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. You have marked them for correction. But then he says, You are purer eyes than to behold evil. You cannot look on wickedness, so why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue? When the wicked devours a person more righteous than he, why do you make men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? Now, reading through that, it kind of gives me the sense that God maybe had showed Habakkuk uh, a picture of what may be happening uh, with the Chaldeans when they get there. We, there's no confirmation of that. But the, his imagery that he's giving is men being taken up like fish, basically, is, is saying that the Chaldeans are going to come through and it's going to be an easy pickings for them. That they're going to be able to come into to Judah and just overtake them easily like fish in a dragnet. Like fish, if you've ever been fishing with a dragnet or, or um, anything like that, don't. But basically they would just take this net, drag it through the water, anything that gets stuck in it, cool, that's the catch for the day. And Habakkuk gets, gets confused for a second. He says, wait, if, you, if you're a God of justice and you don't like evil, then why are you setting evil people upon us? who are supposed to be your chosen people. 
And he struggles with God having uh, allowed a promise to be stripped away from Judah. Obviously not yet. This is more of a prophetic thing. And, and it's going to be happening in the future for them. But he says, God, you're, you've given us this land. You've called us your chosen people. You have promised us this land. You know, through the stories, we know that, that it's been thousands and, or hundreds of years that, that we had to go through Egypt and all this other stuff. And you promised us this land. And, and now it's just going to be taken away. God, what are you doing? God, what is happening? And he begins to question God and see God as, as sort of contradicting himself as the God who, who is righteous and, and loves righteousness and, and is going to allow now such an evil thing to happen to those who are supposed to be God's people. His perception begins to cause him to question God. And again, this is just the first part of our series. And so there's going to be a lot more answers later on um, how we look at this. But this is just the beginning of Habakkuk's sort of transformation as a prophet of God. His perception of reality that God was showing him, which was the prophecy of Judah and the, the Babylonian conquering them, and the reality of his surroundings, which is the depravity of Judah at the moment, but also Judah being God's chosen people, Israel already being destroyed, but Israel being God's chosen people, his perception was beginning to kind of cause him to question God. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? That's the ending of chapter one. That's what he leaves us off with when he's questioning God and he says, are you just going to let them continue, them being the Chaldeans? Are you going to allow them to continue in their evil? Where's the judgment for them? And so we see Habakkuk, his, his perception is burdening him. Throughout this entire chapter, we see, first, he's, he's God, you're silent. God, you're not even here. What are you doing? And then God comes in and he's like, hey, you're right. Let's, let's have some, you know, Judah is supposed to be following, following my precepts, following my laws, and yet they're not. There needs to be judgment. And so he brings in the judgment, or he shows Habakkuk the judgment. It's not quite what he expected. And so he sees God as judgmental, as, as a God of justice. And now he sees God as a God who's contradicting himself, of the God who loves these people and has chosen them to the God who just seemingly wants to take them off the face of the earth. Kind of leaves us with a cliffhanger tonight. But again, over the next few weeks, we're going to see how uh, his perception is going to change his pos position and how his position is going to change his purpose. So stick with us over the next few weeks. We thank you once again for joining us. Let's pray, and we'll see you next week. Father, we thank you for tonight. Again, just allowing us to really view you in a different lens, Father. I pray that as we look at our own surroundings, look at the things that are happening in our lives, Father, may we understand that you are still with us. God, that you're not silent. God, that you're not absent. Father, that you do desire justice, but that justice comes through Christ. Father, that, that justice comes through your righteousness. And Father, that you are not contradictory to yourself, but Father, you love us. You care for us. And Lord, you desire us to have a, a better purpose and that your plans are greater than our plans. So Father, I pray that even though this week uh, was a little bit of a cliffhanger, God, this kind of leaving us with some more questions than we may have wanted. Father, I pray that you would allow Holy Spirit to speak to us uh, during this next week as we really contemplate chapter one of Habakkuk and, and the next couple weeks as we look at chapter two and three. Father, we praise you and we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We love you, and we'll see you on Sunday. Thank you for listening to that message. If you responded or if you have any questions, you can go to www.tlfchurch.com connect. Leave your contact information and your message. Hit submit, and we'll have one of our church staff reach out to you. Remember, you can give online through our website, or you can send in your tithes and offerings by mail. You can find all the info on how to do that by going to 
jlefchurch.com slash online dash giving. Thank you so much for your continual support during this time. We want to let you know that we have our Kids Church Online that meets on a weekly basis through our secured Google Classroom. If you're interested in our Kids Church Online platform, please visit our TLF Online page. Click on the Kids Church Sign Up button to connect with one of our leaders. On Sunday nights, our prayer team is committing one hour of prayer from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. If you have any prayer requests or praise report, you can leave us a message on our TLF online page, or you can send us an email at prayer at tlfchurch.com or send us a text at 323-389-7006. On Wednesday nights, we have our midweek unplugged Bible study at 7 p.m. in which a new devotional will be posted on our website. Join us for this amazing study on the book of Luke. We thank you for joining us online today. We hope that you are blessed, encouraged, and challenged through that message. Hit like, subscribe. Feel free to share this video with others. We love you. We thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again next time. God bless.